The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Big weekend for the Sooners. We had a lot of players in town, and uh, yeah, we got to dive into that. That and a lot more here on the Sooner or Later Sports Show. I am your host, Jay. Thank you for pulling up here on the YouTube channel and listening wherever podcasts are downloaded and listen to while you're here. Go ahead, wipe your feet. Like, subscribe, rate, review. Give us five stars. You don't think we deserve it? Let's go ahead and give us five anyway and uh, gift it. So we're back. Welcome to another episode. We're going to dive into a lot of stuff, but we're really going to center ourselves around a few key topics like the junior uh, elite junior day weekend. A lot of players came into town. We'll talk. A little bit around transfer portal. There's been some things going around, and of course, we got to talk about it. And I also want to wrap it up with, uh, we'll lead off with Sooner moving into a head coaching rank. So y'all know we love to see that, see the Sooners uh, make all those moves or whatnot. So hit us up anytime, and I'm going to bring in my guest for the day. We got our boy PG. Coop's out. It's PG joined us. PG, what's going on, my man? What's going on? How's it going? Happy, uh... What is today? Today Sunday, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, Watching yep. uh, the AFC Championship game. Got to see Let's Young go, Beats baby. win. Kind of sad. I was hoping Lamar could have pulled it off. But, of course, we have to have a receiver that reaches out for the end zone and lose the game. That just sounds like, you know, poetic justice, I guess you could say, or whatnot. And so, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. What's going on, everybody? How's everybody doing? Glad to see y'all jumped in. What's up, Sooner Legends? Hey, Mike, good to see you pull up. Jen, what's good? Steven, what's going on, man? Thanks for pulling up. Hank, always in. Super consistent. My guy, thanks for pulling up to the channel. Kim, what up? Thanks for tuning in as usual. And so, PG, man, uh, I'm going to go give you the moment. How you feeling about your Chiefs winning? We'll let you have this moment. <sighs> you know, okay, so I texted my boss last week during the Bills game, and I said, I think the Chiefs are going to lose here. And then Ooh. all week I said... I don't think the Chiefs are going to beat the Ravens. I said the Ravens are a really damn good team. So maybe I just need to doubt this team. Yeah. And then they'll go win another Super Bowl. But, you know, it looks like Marv or MVS. I can't, I can't say his full name. But MVS. Yeah, he goes out there and he redeems Scanley, himself. Yeah, yeah he, he redeems himself. Um, I saw Kadarius Tony's Instagram live. And you know what? Forget him. He can't catch the ball anyways. We'll trade him. I I I told uh Jantz that I would trade him MVS and Tony for Diggs since he feels like he needs to go get a first round wide receiver, but you know. I mean, I don't think that'd be a bad trade, especially in the aspect of um we all know that Diggs really ain't very happy. So I mean if that's gonna be the case, you may as well um, go for we'll it. We'll take right? C D Lamb too. We'll take nah, C D Lamb. Yeah, C D Lamb. That's 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 just disrespectful. I just I, I just want you to imagine a pairing of Patrick Mahomes I don't, and C D Lamb. I'm not gonna imagine that because it's not an, it's not something that you should imagine. I think it's a level of disrespect and I actually would really appreciate if you watch your mouth while you're here on my show talking about that. That's a level of disrespect that I will not take. <laughs> It won't. It won't be accepted, PG. Like we won't do this here, right? Like listen, no listen, one I'll wants to anybody. see Lamb in Kansas City with everything else they got going on. Listen, listen I'll take anybody. Please. I'll take um, oh uh, Marvin Mims. I'll take Marquise Brown. I'll take any of those Oklahoma wide receivers. Well, I mean, I mean, I think we all would take them. But the thing <laughs> is, I just don't want y'all to get them. I just don't think it's fair that Patrick Mahomes needs more weapons. The last thing he needs is more. Right? We're watching this man play. We're watching greatness break up. It's funny. A buddy of mine called me. And we're sitting there chatting about it. And he's like, hey, man, I got, he's like, I, I'm trying to understand. I mean, are, are we really witnessing greatness right now? And I'm just like, hey, man, did your eyes work? Are you seeing what I'm seeing today? Mahomes is up there, right? He's already shown himself as that talented. And so, yeah, I'm I'm a little, you know, I'm not I'm not upset. If Zay Flowers would have done follow the Belichickian rule, Belichick has one rule that he used to give Patriots player, one, one of the many rules. But one of the big rules for him when running, never reach out for the end zone. Never reach out. Don't ever reach for the line. Why? Because what happened happens at the worst times. Somebody slaps your arm, you fumble it at the half-yard line, and then they recover the fumble. What about you know, the awareness? The awareness for the Chiefs player to go in there and bump that ball out. I mean, it made me think about when the Bucks played against um, the, the Eagles 
And Winfield did that exact same thing to one of the Eagles receivers. He slapped that hand right there at the end zone as he was reaching, slapped it, ball flies right through the back of the end zone. Just loved it. So you cannot do that, right? You can't you can't do the um reaching out thing and think you'll be successful. And told from sorry, my man, I don't want Cowboys fans to have anything because no Cowboys the best fans thing, suck. The best thing I would love is for the Cowboys to continue to suffer. And that's just because I've always not been a Dallas Cowboys fan. No shade on you, my boy. I love you all. But no, I am totally excited at the fact that Dallas just keeps fumbling the bag. <laughs> and it's bad, too, because my buddy's probably listening. one of their probably best teams, and they just. I mean, four straight years of 12 and five is always fascinating to see how it just never, it always falls apart at the end. And I guess for me, it's funny, too, because I'm looking at this Ravens game and the Niners. And the tears that I would drop for for Baltimore and honestly Buffalo as well is that they just keep running into MJ in his prime, right? It's literally everything you saw from Charles Barkley struggling to Clyde Drexler not getting his ring until MJ retired and he was able to play those two seasons. Same thing with Elijah Wan. All these great teams, Jazz, I mean, you go through Indiana with the Pacers and Reggie Miller, the Knicks. All these teams had no chance of going to the NBA Finals in the 90s, all because of one dude just holding it back. And it now, really feels like that's what we're seeing for Patrick Mahomes today. Have you heard the story about how the Chiefs got Patrick Mahomes? No. What Did they realize that they had the best player and they said, oh, we're going to go ahead and go for him? What? No. So actually, um, Matt Nagy tricked the GM into trading up and to getting Patrick Mahomes because oh, they he tricked him into doing it. That's pretty funny. They were not sold on Patrick Mahomes. I can see that originally, and so he had to basically trick him into like basically lying, saying that like Patrick Mahomes had like all of these like intangibles that he really didn't have at the combine, and uh, they got him to trade up, and last minute he got him to sell into buying Patrick Mahomes stock. I, it, if you go listen to like that, there's a documentary out there on it, like, or something. It was like in a documentary. It, it's it, probably in the, uh, with that quarterback show or whatever. Yeah. I, I, it was when I watched it, I was like, that is absolutely insane that they almost didn't draft Mahomes. It, it, yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And, and it happens a lot, man. You know, it's funny. The Ravens, you know, trade up and get to the number 32nd pick just so they can get the five years on Lamar. Because they saw something a lot of people didn't see. And I mean, he keeps leading his team and deep into the playoffs. And all he's got to do is figure out a way to not face Patrick Mahomes. And I think he's fine. Like, that's the only pass I've given to Josh Allen and all of this is that he keeps running into Mahomes. Like, what do you do? I think <laughs> like, next year do? is the year for another team. Usually, so uh, the Chiefs go to two and then not go. So I bet next year they'll go to the AFC Championship game and get squandered by somebody it's just hard it's just hard to go that many times in a row and keep your guys healthy and i i think i think next year's gonna be a pretty down year and that's saying a lot because this year felt down yeah and I, I, we'll just see what the wide receiver room looks like the funny thing is is that his wide receiver room is not that good and they keep doing what they're doing so anyway um Let's talk about some college football, right? I know everybody wants to talk about the portal dudes. We're going to talk about the junior day. And that's the reason why I brought PG on. He has been on fire keeping up with the 2025 kids. And he's been one of the, my key sources because he's been chatting with the players themselves and uh, and really, like I said, keeping a pulse on what's going on in 2025. And so we're going to definitely dive into that. But real quick, I wanted to kind of uh, give a shout out, man. Before we do that, y'all know what to do. Wipe your feet. We got about 100 people in here. We roughly have four likes in this bad boy. Go ahead and hit that like button if you're new to the channel. Feel free to subscribe. I saw a few people went ahead and uh, sub to the channel. Thank you so much, Chris. We appreciate you joining as a member. Uh, we appreciate you too. John, thank you so much. The man, it's Duke Boomer. Rumor Sherpy uh, 99 be out there. He, he puts you on the Twitters if you want to be part of... Uh, find all the Sooners go find him on the bird app I'll make sure to tweet him up that way you guys can find him on my page but hit that like hit the subscribe and make sure you uh show some love on it but besides that let's talk about former Sooner offensive lineman Sharon Moore is now the head coach of the University of Michigan first off I want to give an exciting 
shout out to not only Sharon Moore, but even J- Jim Harbaugh, who's headed to the NFL once again. You know, some people were thinking, oh, he wasn't going to, you know, stick around. Uh, he, he won a championship, so that was the reason why he was getting out of there. He don't like the rules, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's preposterous. I think that if you've been paying attention to Jim Harbaugh, he's been trying to get back to the NFL for like the last five years. It's just the job that he has wanted. Um, not only has it lined up to what he wants, but the teams that he's willing to interview with, they haven't picked him, which is fascinating in itself. But L.A. Chargers, oh, my God, it's a perfect job for him. And so I want to shout out Sharon Moore. PG, when you saw that they went ahead and elevated him from OC, even though we all know that he could do the job because he was the coach in like five games when Harbaugh was suspended or four games while Harbaugh was suspended. What do you think about Moore getting that job? I thought it was the right hire because Moore is likely going to keep the core of that staff together outside of the guys that are going to leave. And he's going to keep a lot of those players there. So you might see one or two guys hit the portal from Michigan here in the spring. I don't really feel like you're going to see it here in the next 30 days. Um, I feel like it's going to be more so in the spring, but uh, Moore is a guy that he's from Derby, Kansas. So he's rooted in this area of the country that is really just putting out a lot of talent. Uh, for for instance, Derby, Kansas is putting out Deshaun Brain this year, who's currently crystal ball to end up at Oregon. But I would imagine that uh, Sharon Moore is going to try to utilize his roots a little bit more on the recruiting trail. And I think you're going to see Michigan uh, end up in the Texas and the Kansas and Oklahoma's backyard. So I thought this was a really good hire. Not to mention, Sharon Moore has put out, what is it, two Joe Morrow Award yeah. offensive lines? like yeah, yeah, last year was Washington. This past season was Washington, but the two years before was Michigan's. Yeah, so when you look at, you know, what this is, like, they're retaining one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. So I think this is a really good hire for Michigan. I, I don't I agree. think you're going to see Michigan have too much of a drop-off. Um, in fact, I would guarantee you're probably going to see better quarterback play out of Michigan. I can see that. And I think that you'll see a difference in the way they play. Now, the only question I have is going to be who is more going to bring in as his offensive coordinator. And then at that point, like you mentioned about quarterback play, I can totally see where you're going with that. The question I ask is, is will they really even change their formula? Because to be honest, that punch them in the mouth, grind, run the ball down your throat, and only throw when you really need to, it works in the Big Ten. Well, and, and it works across, across the success. country. Yeah, think- yeah. The game had shifted from the way Alabama played, which is how Michigan plays now, back in the 2010s. And then it shifted to a little bit of that air raid offense when Lincoln Riley came in. But then I think people found it's really hard to play with a super high tempo offense. And regardless of how good your defense is, they're going to be out there way too much. Yeah. They're going to play way too many snaps. So I think people saw that and said, well, let's dial back the that high tempo offense to still run a high tempo, but make it more of a bully ball. And when you need to, you can create an explosive play. But you're going to try to pound the line of scrimmage, and you're going to play both sides in the trenches really well, and that's what's going to win you the national championship. So I think we're starting to see another change in college football to go back to that style a little bit, but not to a complete reverse kind of like where Alabama was winning three straight national championships. I think they won three straight at that time. Uh, no, no, no nobody, nobody's won three yet. But, that, but they went to three, right? They, I, they, they went to three I think straight. they went to, yeah, I think they did go to three yeah. in a row. Yeah. It, it was back then, back in that days, when they had awful quarterback play, but their defenses were absolutely incredible. Think back to that, what was it, 15-9 to nine? Alabama LSU championship. No, oh, yeah, yeah, that was that <laughs> that's, game was that, We're awful. not going to go back that far, but I think we're going to meet somewhere probably in the middle, and I think that's where college football is probably going to thrive. And I think Sharon Moore is probably going to help kind of lead that way a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. And and that game itself, you know, as you as you mentioned, the the oh god, that was an awful game. It was uh, ugh. it was. So, I mean, I, I get the defensive battle, and it got a lot of people excited. I had zero interest in the excitement of that game being as slow as it was. It was really, really such a slow um, 
methodical game. It just was not entertaining to watch them just beat up on each other and no one can move the ball offensively. And it's, everybody was just bad offensively. But yeah, I could totally say that going into those old school bully ball. And that seems to work. Like it works, especially in the playoffs. It's just my dudes versus your dudes. Who's got the best dudes? Joe's versus, versus pros type deal. And Michigan just went out there and just was the most physical team. And I think more will keep that going. I think that that's the mindset that he's going to keep implanted in them. I think Michigan keep the go- keep it going. Now, granted, the biggest thing is they're losing. They're going to lose a nice chunk of players, but I don't think it really makes that much of a. Um, I don't think it's going to be that much of a drop off as people expect. Especially as you mentioned, he's going to retain a lot more of the players because he is staying, and you know. Portal's going to open. You'll see a few players here and there decide, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go somewhere else. But I think it, you can hit the nail on the head. I think majority of those players are going to leave probably in the spring window whenever it happens because school's already started. Most of them are just going to go ahead and get their training in. And then once the spring window hits, you'll probably start seeing some shifting because at that point, class is hitting. That's kind of one of the big, the big problems of the transfer portal um, on top of just college football in general is that everything is in – the window of classes and you never have enough weeks to be able to get the portal open and let people move around and still be able to hit classes on time, but all because the timing is always bad. But anyway, well, and I'll say this, I don't think we're going to see as big of a drop off with Michigan as people think. I don't think people really have paid attention a whole lot to their class, which yeah, I get it. It was the number 19 overall class, but it's a very good class. Uh, they got one of the top offensive tackles in the in the recruiting class in Andrew Sprague. This was a guy Oklahoma actually pursued pretty hard early on. Then they got Jaden Davis. Jaden Davis was a five-star quarterback at one point until he pretty much just stopped going to camps, yep. right? Then, you know, when you stop going to camps, they start paying less attention to you. You fall in the rankings. Uh, they loaded up on the offensive line. They got some decent tight ends. Uh, listen, I think Michigan reloaded. I think they're going to have to go in the portal and probably address a couple needs, but I think they're going to figure out what those needs are in the spring. And then I, I don't think we're done seeing Alabama, Arizona, and Washington portal additions. I think those are probably going to happen in the spring when they figure out where these new coaches are going to have them on the depth chart. So I think Michigan will probably go and take a couple of those. I don't think Michigan loses a whole lot of people though. No, I agree with you there. That, that's a, that's a darn good point. And so let's, let's, uh let's transition from that right into these recruits. Let's talk about this junior day. So thank y'all for pulling up, hit that like button. So wipe your feet. If you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe. I'd love to have you join us here on the channel, you know, Talking ball, talking OU football, talking some college football to add to it. And, of course, having a blast. Do it. So, PG, it has been an interesting, interesting weekend, right? We just saw the Elite Junior Day come through. All the social media posts has been going down. You've been keeping a running list of players announcing that they're going to come. And a lot of them pulled up. So let's talk about some of these top players that we both seen pull up here. First and foremost, the one I think that we've got to we've got to talk about first off is going to be uh, Jonah Williams, the big linebacker, safety athlete guy out of uh, Galveston, Texas. He he pulled up. Looked like he was pretty happy about his visit. What you think about that? Well, I hear he can get out of the belly of a well. So uh, if I can get a recruit that can do that, I want him. No, Jonah Williams had a great time. Uh, and there's been some rumblings that I know everybody has heard the rumors of an offensive guy locking it up. I've heard rumors that there's a defensive guy. I'm still trying to figure out exactly who that is. Uh, I don't think it's Jonah Williams, but Jonah Williams has been very high on Oklahoma for a while. You know, even before a lot of programs around the country were really paying attention to Jonah Williams, uh, Jonah Williams was sporting Oklahoma gear. So if you're an Oklahoma fan, yeah, I know you watch the A&Ms and schools like that because he's from Texas uh, in that recruitment. But Jonah Williams 
like if I had to pick today, I'm saying it's an Oklahoma W. Like everything that he does uh, points to Norman being his destination. And you've got Brandon Hall on the case here. And Brandon Hall has proven to be a very good recruiter for us. Uh, you know, he's landed Jaden Hardy, he's landed Peyton Bowen, and and I, and I think Jaden Hardy is going to be one of Oklahoma's best safeties. So, yeah, I, I'm really liking Oklahoma's chances here with Jaden or uh, with uh, Jonah Williams. Yeah, he's he's that one player, and as it was mentioned in the in the chat by our boy Topher, it's one of those players that you do whatever it takes to get that young man to mm -hmm. pull up and be here. And like you said, he came in. He looked excited. Um, oh, he's going to play Cheetah. I, I know a lot of people are kind of going back and forth. Oh, he'll be a safety. Oh, he'll be a linebacker. No, this dude going to be a Cheetah. Like, he is that talented. He's a freak athlete. Uh, and you don't get too many guys, I think, that can play the safety position that well, but can also come up and play at that linebacker position. So Right. He he's he's freakishly when it comes to being athletic too. I mean he's six three. I think he's listed at about two hundred pounds right now and he's mm -hmm. probably a lot more he's probably more than that. He's one of those players that can play he's I mean he's an athlete. He's listed as an athlete for a reason. That's just how talented the kid is. And like you said, he looked like he enjoyed his visit here at Oklahoma. You can tell that he was happy to be in town. You know, announced that he was here, and based upon the reports, yeah, our boy is gonna probably be one of those that you're gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah. So we we we, we gonna do this? We 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 gonna win this? And here's why you want him, and here's why he's a five star. Uh, he had a four five forty. Uh, his max on the bench is two twenty five. He had six reps of one hundred and eighty five pounds. His hundred meter dash was eleven five. Uh, he can deadlift three ninety five. Like this dude squatting three fifteen. Like yeah, I want this dude all day long. Exactly. So, all right, let's look into some of the players. I don't know you had uh you've talked to and had some good conversation with. We've got um we got our boy Blaylock, right? We've got um Tory uh Blaylock, the son of Derek Blaylock. His dad here just posted this on the social medias uh of the picture from his son being here hanging out with us. And this running back, yeah, man. I think DeMarco Murray might be hitting another home run out there like he always does. PG, I know you've chatted up with him. Talk to me. What, 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 what you hearing about him? Yeah, I mean, Blaylock wants to have his recruitment wrapped up by the beginning of the season. That's what I was told. Now, there's obviously a big window between now and the beginning of the football season. So, I think... <clears throat> I have a hard time with saying that He's going to commit next week, and here's why. You have one scholarship spot in that room, presuming. You know, obviously, the spring could hit Oklahoma. You could lose somebody in that running back room. Presumptions, you only have one scholarship spot. Do you go ahead and lock up that spot now, or do you tell them, we're going to keep you as a silent, and then DeMarco Murray gets some of these other running backs in the room, and make his final decisions because you had Michael Turner, you had Demarius Robinson, you had Tory Blaylock on campus. I think you maybe want to see Riley Wormley one more time. Hmm. Although I kind of believe that one's going more Oregon's direction, kind of like the Deshaun brain recruitment. I mean, if you get Tory Blaylock, I don't think you're really complaining though. I mean, the dude can catch the ball out of the backfield. Um, he's very good at running, finding those gaps. So, yeah, I mean, if if you're an Oklahoma fan, like you're seeing all the predictions flowing through, there's a reason why. The staff feels really good. Like if you talk to uh, anybody around Blaylock's camp, like the the hopes have been really high on Oklahoma before that. You just kind of wanted to see how Junior Day went, uh, and I was actually under the impression Michael Turner would be the running back to pull his to pull the trigger early because he's been here as well multiple times. He's a running back that the staff's high on, but uh, Tory Blaylock looks like he might be the guy to get to it first. Yeah, if and if he pulls that trigger because Turner didn't make it out here, um, like we anticipated, but yeah, if he pulls the trigger, <laughs> that room is going to be fun. We'll just say that on, on the players that we've got coming in. All right, we had another five-star that did pull up. You know I mean, Tory is a four-star running back. He's the one that's been getting a lot of crisper balls over the last tw you know 12 hours of a player that we think is going to be pulling up. But you also had another five-star that showed up in Caleb Cunningham, the 6'3 wide receiver out of Mississippi. Now, I remember seeing a prediction go in for him 
to uh, Mississippi State, like basically Jeff Levy continuing his recruiting of you know players. He 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 threw his hands out there to say, hey, what's good? Can we are are we possible in getting him? I'm looking at Caleb as a player. I'm like, he's an athlete that you got to get your hands on, right? And I know it's going to be tough getting him from to leave his home state. But how you feeling around Caleb, and and what, what, what's the rumbles you seeing and, and hearing about him right now? It's it's a five star wide receiver recruitment, and I I would be a hundred percent shocked if he ends up in this class. But supposedly he's got some big announcement tomorrow, and supposedly he was on campus longer. I was talking to uh, one of the guys on the defensive side of the ball for the recruits that was on campus a little bit later as well than everybody else. Uh, so he was kind of giving me the scoop about Caleb Cunningham, telling me about that, but. Uh, I, I would be really shocked. I mean, it's just Ole Miss is around in that recruitment, and you know Ole Miss likes to throw around the money. They ain't hiding it. Uh, you know, Lane Kiffin's there, and, I mean, would it, it wouldn't shock me to see Lane Kiffin, you know, have some recruiting violations come up in the next couple of years, right? Because, you know, he's just that kind of person where he's going to go around and he's going to, you know, He's gonna he's gonna push he's gonna test the waters a little bit, but this dude you're right he's an absolute dynamic athlete he plays basketball track and field um, he's a mismatch for anybody on the field uh, he incredible at running after the catch so yeah I mean like I'm sure Emmett Jones made a pitch to him that was pretty compelling I mean Emmett Jones being one of the best wide receiver coaches in college football definitely one of the better recruiters in college football right now I mean you're probably not putting all your chips in the basket for Isaiah Mosey at this point. So, yeah. You, I, I mean, you're looking at your wide receiver targets of Jacaden Ferguson, Emmanuel Choice, Isaiah Mosey, and now Caleb Cunningham. Like, I mean, uh, Emma Jones is... <laughs> he's in a good spot right now. I want to be in his position as a <laughs> recruiter. Like, I, I want to have a five-star on campus that stays longer, one that not a lot of people, including myself, expected you to potentially have a shot for to now all of a sudden have a shot for. I mean, that's Yeah, I think that's what jumped out to me, too, is that he was one of those players that we were trying to figure out, is he, is he a player that we really think Oklahoma has a chance at? And then you get him here and he sticks around for a little bit and you're just like, oh, word? Like, so you you actually enjoy it. And we all know that Emmett Jones is a master when it comes to recruiting. He's proven himself at what he's done in that wide receiver room. As I've mentioned before, that wide receiver room was the room that we questioned the most going into the season. We had so many young players. We didn't know what it looked like. And then, boom, you've got dudes. You're like, oh, wait. No, th th these guys can ball, and Emmett Jones knows what he is doing, and that's the one thing that really gets me excited is that we've got a team, we got a coach that people respect out there in the recruiting trail. And so, I mean, you mentioned another one that uh, also jumped out to me too. I'm glad you said it, Manny Choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was there this weekend and seemed like he had a really good time. I wouldn't say this would be Oklahoma's choice like number one choice in terms of a guy you'd go out there and grab um i, I somebody I'm that i'm is. really high on that i feel like he's of, one that you take <laughs> yeah i mean he's one that you take but somebody that i'm really high on that a lot of people aren't paying attention to is jacaden ferguson okay like that is a guy that i would take over emmanuel choice i don't I, I definitely wouldn't i wouldn't take him over caleb cunningham but i would i'd take him over emmanuel choice again i think this is going to come down to who commits first? There's only one spot left. Um, and, I mean, at this point, it's like, if Caleb Cunningham wants to commit, yeah, I mean, and you've already got the spots filled, you probably take him, and you can process somebody out. But, I mean, at this at the end of the day, I want to put the pressure on him. And I want to say, listen, I got one spot left. I don't care if you're a five-star or not. I want you to hop on board right away. No, that's a good point. And I think if you get... And, and honestly, processing, I may not even need to. You may actually have some extra space. If we get Nick Anderson out there cooking like we should, I mean, he's draft eligible, you know? Oh, so, he's going to be a, he, he, he a first-rounder if he really continues to if, put the if, if he puts up what he did this season like he did last year, dude's probably going to be a, a day one or early day two draft pick easily. And so if you get him late in the first, all you got to do is get him 1,000 yards. He gets 1,000 yards this year. Teams are going to be like, yep, we'll take him now. He's got all of it. He's got the route running ability. He's got the intangibles you're looking for from a person in that position. 
And yeah, that, that may actually, like I said, open up an additional spot because we'll lose that receiver. Andrew Anthony, he has another year. Well, Jalil Farouk's definitely going to be probably be gone. I think this is his last year. But him, Andrew Anthony, if he shows out, he's done. Uh, as well as you know Nick, so I mean that's three wide receivers that's most likely gone from there. Well, and you're gonna have the Purdue transfer. Um, well, because like there was a lot of people shocked left. he didn't go to the draft this year. And that's fair. I mean, and I think that depends on the numbers he put up. So there's a chance out of those four names that we just put out there, three of them, three of them could potentially end up putting themselves their names into the to the league. Right? That's Correct. huge. Yeah, and That's I huge. mean, and and then you got Jaden Gibson, right? You need to see what he's going to be able to do because, I mean, he's your wild card. He's your yeah. wild card, and what you're going to get out of him. But many choice, man. I, I like I like the size you get out of him. He's what six four, six five. About 200 pounds, and that's like actual size and weight. So that's just another big win on the Ibit Jones piece. And so it's funny because let's talk a little bit more about who all pulled up here. I had a few people at, you know, kind of pointing out a couple of these things. And PG, I think this is something for us to definitely talk about is if you look at this junior day, it was very heavy on one thing defenders. Right. You saw majority of those players on there. You saw corners, safeties, linebackers, D linemen. You saw D ends and athletes that can mainly play on the defensive side of the ball. So a lot of people was pointing out, hey, these lists that are coming out from all these sites, the list that me and you compiled, there's not a lot of offensive linemen on there. And why is that? And it's so like, for for example, your boy uh Fasuzi decided that he wasn't gonna make a visit. And some people were freaking out. And I pointed this out to him. Hey, he already stated in an article for those that keep up with recruiting. Um, and I say this to anybody on here. If you don't keep it up with it religiously like I do, PG do, and some other fans do, make sure you do your research before, you know, losing your mind about certain things. Because Michael Fasuzzi said that he wasn't revisiting places he's already been. He's been to Oklahoma. How many times, PG? Oh, like six seven times right and the thing is he's got to go around and he's got to see the new he's got to he's got to go around and see the landscape because there's a lot of hype and i know a lot of people are freaking out about the missouri stuff and i i even dove into the missouri thing with them because i was like listen like you spoke really highly about them like i need to know what them what they doing up there and i mean really it's just you know they just got a guy that really can have a good relationship like he's really good at building that so i mean I, I if you're an oklahoma fan you shouldn't really worry that much about michael fasusi like yeah. he's got a really good relationship with bill beatenbow he's been here a lot he's got former yeah. teammates here like <laughs> and that's the key thing i want to point out is that he's one of those players that been here a lot so it's like, I want to go see what else is going on out in college football. I want to get all my visits in because y'all know the Venables has the rule. You know, once you commit, there's no reason for you to be going out, you know, and do additional, you know, visits and stuff, doing official visits anywhere else. Go ahead and commit, be committed and be done. You know, go see college football. You know, some kids end up going to games here and there with friends, uh, but a lot of them have conversations with the team and point out, you know, Hey, I'm just going to go to the game with some friends. I'm not there on a, on a visit quote unquote. So if that's the case, you should expect dudes to get their visits in before they go. This is the reason why July is when we see all most, if not all of our commitments, right? This is why that is our commitment season is July. Like this year we lucked out because I'm going to be honest. I honestly think that the reason why we have a lot of, of we had a lot of commitments for the 25 class was because people were wondering what the rules change was going to be on uh, uh, scholarships because before the scholarship rule was the t limit was 25. You ain't getting no more than 25 per class. Well, they removed it. That limit was removed because of COVID and the opening of the transfer portal. And now it's gone. You can recruit up to 85 players if you want to because they are going to take up your 85 roster spots. Now that that's the case, those early commitments was probably because they thought the rules were going to change back because the ruling hadn't happened yet, and they wanted to make sure that you uh, they got themselves a spot. Now at this point, you know, you're probably going to see some dudes decide to wait before they do it. 
Am I crazy? Yeah. I mean, I think that might be a part of it. I also think the transfer portal plays a huge factor because I think a lot of these recruits start to see, you know, Oklahoma get absolute dudes out of the portal, right? Or you see, you know, guys that have only played one year and they're going to a place and now, you know, another school's getting three years of eligibility out of a guy that's produced. Like, I think they're starting to see spots fill up out of the portal and they start to say, well, I know I want to be at Oklahoma. Yeah, like I would love to go see some scenery, but I want to go be at Oklahoma and I don't want to, I want to make sure that my wide receiver spot isn't given to a guy with two or three years of eligibility out of the portal. I, so I think you're going to see a little bit of that as well. Um, now, a guy like Fasusi, you know, I hate to say this, and I know people aren't going to like this. He's a five star offensive lineman, and it's going to be the same thing for defensive linemen. Like, at this point, you're going to go visit all of the elite schools that you know can develop you. And you're going to go figure out, because it's not, at that point, it's not about development. You like you know you're getting, you've got some of the best offers from across the country by some of the best developers. So development, let's take that off the table. You're going to get that at Oregon, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma. You're going to get it. Because like it or not, Texas is producing a good offensive line right now. Yeah. They're developing. At this point, it's going to come down to where do you feel home is? Right, so where do you feel the most comfortable? Who's got the best facilities? Because believe it or not, recruits actually go into places and say, "Hey, if I get hurt, how quickly can you get me back on the field and I be a hundred percent healthy?" I've talked to multiple recruits where that is outside of development their number one priority. And then also, yeah, you're going to want to see the NIL money, right? Right. You're going to want to see what kind of offers you can get, especially if you're a recruit and you're hearing that, "Hey, this school's throwing out this much money." Why not go? Why why not go test the waters? So, believe it or not, like it or not, that's how the landscape is. You're probably going to see three stars, maybe some low tier four star guys commit early, try to lock up their spots. Five star guys, you're going to see them drag it out a little bit longer because, yeah. hey, there will always be a spot for them. Right, and and that's the problem. Really, is 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 that that that's just that's just the game right there. Right, those guys have. They're, they're five stars, right? So when you're a five star, you're so coveted. You're an offensive lineman. You're super coveted. It's going to be work no matter what you do in the whole process of commitment and conversation and stuff. But let's dive into the defensive side of the ball because, PG, we had some pretty nice defensive players. And I know one that you was pretty excited about. <laughs> that you 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 you've been you've been throwing your name in the hat for on a couple of players. One of them is going to be on the D line. I know everybody's talking D line. We're going to talk D line. We'll work up the linebackers, and we'll fi finish up with a cornerback that I cannot wait to make a video on and really talk about. But let's talk D line. Here's your boy here, Landon Rink, mm -hmm. out of uh, what was that Sci Fair down there in the Houston nice area. Place. Yep. Yeah, this kid's something uh something different. I mean, when you when you look at the measurables on him, he's sitting at what? Um Oh, he is a 6'2, 270. So he's not the tallest guy in the world. Obviously, to be interior, he needs to put on a little weight. Oh, he uh, will. But you're not you're not really too worried about that. Here's my thing: 6'2, 270 going into your senior year in high school. He'll add about 15 pounds a year because he's about that size. He, he's, he's got the frame to be a big boy that's disruptive. And watching his film, I'm just like, oh, yeah, he's disruptive. He's like, a dude. He calls problems. He's mm -hmm. a dude. He gets off good. He is a dude. And so when I look at him and I see him here with, uh, with Bates, I'm like, okay. They're, they're going after the real ones. Talk to me about them. Because, like I said, you've been high on them, high on this four-star. You've been, you know, talking through the uh, – trying to potentially put out some predictions on this cat. What you feeling about him? Yeah, so actually, I, um, I'll give you all a little nugget. I am putting in a prediction for him. I just haven't had a chance to make the graphic. Um, I'll be making a video and putting that out later this week discussing why. But, no, uh, I, I understand a lot of people are having a hard time getting over how his dad was a former – Texas defensive lineman from 1991 to 1995. Yep. I get it. A lot of people are having a hard time getting over that. Here's the deal, though. 
the relationship with Texas, it's just not there, guys. Like it, it, it was kind of there with Bo Davis. For those of y'all that are in the Discord, you guys know my take on that. So join Jay's Discord so that you can kind of get the scoop there. But um, I, listen, I, I think Oklahoma, in terms of the relationship that Todd Bates has with Landon Rink, with how many times he has been to Oklahoma. Remember, Oklahoma is not close to him. He's down there in that Houston area. That is an eight-hour drive. That is an eight-hour drive. I've made it many times to go on a cruise. It's not an easy drive. It is a boring drive. He's been to Oklahoma multiple times, numerous times. I'm trying to pull up the exact number. Uh, I think it's, let's see here. Uh, now five times he's been to Texas nine. Texas is right down the road. A&M, right down the road. He's been there three times, right? You expect all those Texas schools to get visits. He's been to Oklahoma five times. And every time I talk to him, and I talk to him about the Todd Bates relationship, he tells me every time, it's the best relationship I have. Todd Bates, I love that dude. And Landon Rink got to spend a lot of time with other guys that were really high on Oklahoma that are currently in this class that you expect to be there. Hence, yep. a Kobe Sellers. So, you know, I, I asked him um, about the visit. He says, you know, what really stood out was the family environment, which, again, that's not a shock. We've talked about that a couple times. He says, I have a great relationship with Kobe Bates. I want it to be done. I want to be done with my recruitment around official visit time. But in talking about takes Texas A&M and Texas visits, these were the exact words I got. They're both great programs. I think they're going to be very competitive next year. That's all you can ever get out of him. That's about all you can ever get when it comes to Texas and Texas A&M. So I understand a lot of people were burned by the Colton Vasek. But guys, Landon Rink, I think he's a different guy. I think he's a different dude. I think y'all should be excited if we land him. This is a guy that's, I think, going to be a top 200 player when it's all said and done. And I'll say this, though. Like, like no, no, no beef. You know, no, no shade to anything. You, you know, as you say what you say, though, I'm still on the side of caution in this entire situation because until the ink is dry and the pen is, uh, he signs on the line, which is dotted, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm actually sold on the idea of him being a Sooner. It ain't nothing on him. I just got to see it, especially being a legacy from Texas, which is a fascinating one. Somebody mentioned that. You know, it was uh, my popped in here on that one. Nick, yeah, he is a Texas legacy. And so that's one of those players you ask the question of, okay, what does it look like? But the good thing in our favor is, you know, Texas has some changes on the line, right? Bo Davis is gone. He's at LSU. Hence why our boy, unfortunately, Don McKinley is probably signing there in February in two weeks because Bo Davis bounced out and he's there. So now we got that. It's kind of like, dang. Yeah. You either love him right. or you hate him. You either love him or you hate him when it comes to Bo Davis. But I'll say this, and the reason why I don't think Texas is going to heavily pursue Landon Rink, they've got a lot of other options that they really like, like Zion Williams out of Lufkin, Texas. Actually, they're actually pursuing Xavier Ukponu pretty hard, who is a guy Ooh. out of Ditton Geyer, played with Jackson Arnold, Eli Bowen, Peyton Bowen. It's a guy I would love to see Oklahoma go after. They're in the recruitment for Ethan Utley, uh, DJ Sanders out of Belleville, Texas. Like They actually have some higher targets that are higher up on the totem pole in terms of rankings and class that they're going to go after that I think Oklahoma is going to silently come in and sneak in and grab Landon Rink, who might be more of a hidden gem, and Texas might try to go after the guys like in, in, in their own state that are a little bit more highly ranked. I mean, they've already got Lance Jackson committed on the defensive line, so... I'm not too worried about it. I'm not too worried about the legacy thing coming into effect. I'm, I think a lot of people are looking too much into that. Well, there's another one on this list right here that we're looking at. We've got our guy, um, Max Granville. I think he's another one Ooh. that jumped out to me. I mean, the, the big Ooh. Ed 6'3", 205 now, but you can see in the picture right here, his frame looks like he can add in another, another 40 to 50 pounds, no problem, of just muscle and run dudes down, right? Yeah, I know that Oklahoma is very high on the kid, and he's not one of those players that I take lightly as far as his skill set goes, right? You know, I'm going to share a little bit of – I pulled up some of his film because I thought it would be a good idea to watch him play, uh, especially since he's got it on Twitter. That dude is a motor. He don't stop, right? 
I've been watching some of his film for like the last few weeks. I've been hearing his name, especially in the last year, as a player that Oklahoma has been heavily in pursuit of, and looks like someone that has is really considering Oklahoma. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna see what he looks like. PG, yeah, man, um, I like what I see. What you think about Granville and how you feel about Oklahoma's chance of landing him? Oh, I think I think he's in Oklahoma's bag. Uh, in fact, I think this is a guy that's probably already silent committed, and we just don't know it yet. Um, he's actually got, uh, I think, there's a couple of other insiders I shall not name that I have predictions in for him. you got Sam Spiegelman and Josh McQuishan also have predictions in for him. So Oklahoma's Miguel Chavis, they've been heavily produced. Now, here's the other thing. Miguel Chavis doesn't have to go after a ton of guys this cycle like he's got a very good young defensive end room so which is good yeah so like he can go all in on the guys that he wants and max granville is one of those guys you go look at what he's been able to do at the high school level 32 and a half sacks nine forced fumbles six fumble recoveries 44 tackles for loss 160 total tackles like yeah, this is a dude you want on your team. I, and, I, and I think Oklahoma's going to get him. Get him. Uh, he was actually one of the guys that hung out with Kobe Sellers and Landon Rink uh, throughout the visits, and he spent a lot of time with them. So uh, I, I do think you probably land Max Granville at this point. He's been to Oklahoma like four or five times, at, at the, I think, at this point. I can see that. Tanya, thank you so much for uh, the donation, the five bucks. We appreciate the love. We really appreciate it. Thank you always for showing love and coming by. Reggie Powers Jr. is in here. What's up? <laughs> what up, Reggie? This dude, hey, man, I didn't heard the numbers this dude didn't camp. We're going to talk about that on the other side, but we're going to talk about it. This is, a, this is a player that y'all need to make sure y'all pay attention to. But, no, watching this film, yeah, I'm, I'm hardcore sold on – what we're si- what we could potentially get out of Granville he's, a, he's just here. explosive. He's he strong. He, he has no. I mean, when you go watch his film, he can easily move offensive linemen out of the way, right? Which yes. which tells you the kind of strength that he has. And being able to be as explosive as he is, let's say he adds fifteen more pounds and doesn't lose that explosiveness, doesn't lose the speed that he has. Oh my God, this guy is going to be an absolute monster on the defensive line for Oklahoma. So it's true. Oh, yeah. second, Reggie Power. Co- Mr. Powers, you're right. I forgot. Reggie is the third. <laughs> Your kid's a monster. And, uh, yeah, we we going to talk about it. Thank you. My bad. I forgot. You, he is the third. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. next kid. Next kid, though. Next kid, though. Real talk. Next kid, though. This one. Christian Jones moved Woo. to the linebacker spot, right? Out of Nebraska, 6'3", 220 is what he's listed at. And I know that I've, I've been seeing some reports. Man, Oklahoma is high. On them and they're working them. I, I actually, uh, Will Fong dropped an article today. It's like it's free to everybody. Uh, oh, I actually one of VIPs and talked about some of the experience. And it sounds like Christian Jones really enjoyed himself on his mm-hmm. visit. I know that you've been uh, trying to get communication with them, PG. I, I think he's one of those players that man, he could be a ch- game changer. And and Coach Alley is already out there making an impact. Man, it sounds like he's he's being influential to some of these recruits. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, he he's coming on the pod. We're trying to work out the details, so we're gonna get him on to because uh, I, I I wanted to get a linebacker on for you all to specifically talk about Zach Alley, and so that you guys can get a feel for who he is because mm-hmm. I, I he's so new and we haven't really been able to see what he's done on the recruiting trail. So this was a good one. Now Christian Jones, uh, he he doesn't want to commit anywhere. Until the end of his senior season, he wants to go through the process. He wants to see all of these teams in action. So I, in, I don't think we're going to see a commitment from Christian Jones for a while. If we do see one, it would really shock me. But he had a great meeting with Brenton Venables again. Uh, Zach Alley was kind of introduced into this recruitment a little bit, uh, and and you know he really liked how OU makes an emphasis on developing you into an elite, in his words, an elite man and help you guide you through your life and impact the world. So he loves the soul mission. He loves the, just the, the roots of what Oklahoma is about, which is what you hear a lot of recruits and recruits parents say about Oklahoma, right? That soul mission and, and what these, uh, like what the staff does to develop the kids just 
outside of football. Like that's a huge emphasis with some of these recruits. So Christian Jones, high on Oklahoma, but don't expect this recruitment to end anytime soon. And that's what I anticipate that it's going to be some time to uh, really seal the deal on this one. And that's the beauty of recruiting, man. You can be oh. high on somebody one day and down on them the next day. But he know, might be a five star though. Like he might end up as a five star linebacker. Hmm. <laughs> You think that he's, he can uh, push up there to the top? I mean, I know he's 120th in the country right now at um, uh, nationally, and he's the, the, the 15th ranked the linebacker uh, on 247's composite. So if he can make some leaps up from that, yeah, I could totally see it. But we got to see what those changes will be once the season starts or the way he camps. The question is, if he goes to enough camps and gets enough evaluations, I could totally see it. But that's usually the hard part. Yeah, no, and, you know, he's in Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, so it's not like these camps are close to him. He'll have to travel down a little bit. But, I mean, all he's got to do is continue to put up the numbers that he's been putting up. Yeah, no, and and he's the linebacker that we would love to have. This class, I think I anticipate we'll get two to three linebackers. I mean, we're going to start seeing some players, uh, you know, move move up and move out and do some things. So this is kind of that point where we need to get ready to start restocking. But luckily we're a young team. I like to preach that to y'all because y'all don't get it. A lot of people don't get it. Yeah. If you put very a, young. It's yeah, you, especially on defensive side of the ball. Yeah. If you put a gun to my head and asked me what linebackers Oklahoma probably lands and you said you only get two picks, I would look at Christian Jones and probably Dawson Merritt, uh, who's out of Blue Valley uh, in Stillwell, Kansas. Oh, Okay. Yeah. In the Overland Park area. Not too bad. Okay. Okay. That's a good point. All right. Let's move back into the to the to the to the to that uh corner position, right? We we've got somebody pulling up that's uh appearing to be um excited. Kobe Sellers, right? <laughs> PG, you've already put out a tweet on it. 511, one roughly 170 uh corner out of uh Pearland, Texas. Appears that he loves Oklahoma to the point that we're seeing a whole bunch of crystal balls fly down the line. What you thinking about Mr. Sellers here? Shoot, I've had my crystal ball in for Kobe since like... It's been a while. Remember, like it's been a long time. Kobe loves Oklahoma. Uh, now, this has been an Oklahoma-Texas battle for a while. Uh, Texas A&M's been kind of creeping in there a little bit. But, I mean, the foothold that Jay Valai has on this recruitment with Kobe, um, I really don't expect this recruitment to last too much longer. I, I-, I think by spring ball, he's going to be a Sooner. Like, I... He's just, he talks so highly of Oklahoma every single time. Uh, You know, he's up here all the time. Like, I don't think people realize how many times he's been to Oklahoma. So, um, and he knows. Like, here's the deal. When a recruit and you are kind of talking about the silent commit and they know who's silent committed and they're excited about it, I think that kind of gives it away, right? Right. And the thing about him that I noticed, too, with, with him is... In watching his film, he played quarterback. He played, mm-hmm. you know, he's all around athlete. He's going to play corner in the college game, but he can read holes. He does great on the return game. And when he's playing corner, he likes to hit. Like, that was one thing. You know, I've talked about this with a lot of the recruits that we've gone after over the last few years is that, you know, you know, so Oklahoma's going to have to do is they like to hit people, right? Ones that like the level folks. Talk about Reggie the third, right? I mean, he has a whole highlight film of him just hitting folks. Yeah. That is just, that's just, I get, to, I get a little like, emotional thinking about it, dog. Give me a second. This is the guy that you have to put on special teams too, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, he, oh, he's <laughs> one that, yeah, he could be a return guy. And you don't have to have much fear of him getting hurt because it's kind of his, his bag is doing that. And so I know that's the thing that n- makes people nervous. And I, I mean, that's why you don't see Billy Bowman really back there or Peyton uh, Bowen as much as because the fear of injury. You don't want anybody to get hurt. Cause I totally get that. That's that's kind of the thing that, that that that's unnerving when it when it comes to having those players out there in the return game. Is you don't the last thing you need is some is one of your key players getting hurt and you're gonna be sitting there just like, uh, yeah, we 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 lost the top guy. That 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 hurts. But I mean, if you get enough of them. Oh, yeah, and you start throwing dudes out there, especially if you've got some coverage behind them. And I think Kobe's one of those players that can give you coverage not only in the uh, secondary, but also 
uh, give you another person that could do those returns. I mean, he's what a four four forty uh, laser time. Oh, he, he's fast. But and this is the thing a lot of people need to understand too. So you're about to see a different change in how Oklahoma recruits and plays players. So the past couple of years, you've had to see BV and the staff play young guys because the talent just really hasn't been there. I think starting with this 2025 class, this is going to be the class that you start to see them kind of sit a year. You kind of let some guys finish out their time. And then after a year of experience, they come in and they start to take over, right? Yep, you can really start developing mm -hmm. at this point. This is the yep. point where developing is really some of the things you can do. And that that's huge. Remember, the way that these team, this team is trying to be built, the way Oklahoma is trying to do things is we want to live in the recruiting world and use the portal like Georgia does and just patchwork certain players in that you can that that you probably need additional guy there. Like you don't you don't want to live in the portal too much because nothing has proven to us that that is there there's success there. We haven't seen any national championships come from a team that's built off of the transfer portal. And so until you really see that that flux I don't anticipate us seeing that going happen here at Oklahoma at all. So PG Talk mm -hmm. transfer portal, right? I know that we've been pushing to get some additional offensive linemen in the portal. The Hatchet Brothers, I know, was a, the, the big topic of discussion. Don't know what that looks like right now. All I know is that Oklahoma's still in pursuit, and I do anticipate either picking up something this now or at the spring window. That's probably something that's going to go down in – I say in that, in that time period, right? Like last year, a lot of our best players came through in, I mean, the, the, your Dejan Terriers of the world, you know, they showed up right after spring and they all enrolled in the June range and became impactful early. I sense that's what we're going to go for when it comes to that, right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna keep pursuing the guys that we can get our hands on. And I think we also like our room, right? We like what we're doing, but we got a lot of players need to push after PG. How you feeling about our, uh, our push for some of these players? Don't get discouraged. If we don't land the hatchet brothers, right? Don't get discouraged. If we don't get any more guys through the portal. And the reason why I say that is, is because I, I think, yeah, it would be really good to get at least one more guy on the offensive line, but it's not necessarily needed. Like, I think you could probably rotate in some of these freshmen, especially early, and kind of see if they're able to step up when needed. I think some of the guys you got in the portal are pulling good enough. I think Bill Beatonbow is going to have a decent offensive line. I think it'll be probably middle of the road for the SEC. I see some people in here asking about Casey Poe. Casey Poe is locked in with Alabama, and I don't expect that to change unless something just doesn't go Alabama's way like drastic changes because you got to remember he he is a legacy Alabama guy he had a family member play True. for Bear Bryant now yes he thought he was going to play for Nick Saban but I mean there there's just some heavy ties there to Bama so I'm not expecting Casey Poe to end up in Oklahoma anytime soon um, or at all so yeah I mean I think they've done a good job I'm not really expecting Oklahoma to pull anybody else in the portal right now unless just somebody elite hits the portal and somebody you can't live without which i mean and when those guys hit the portal we've seen it it's usually a bag situation that oklahoma is not willing to get involved in because you don't want your players making more than your coaches so well i mean some of them already do but i think the bigger piece is is there's certain players you're willing to do that for especially if they're proven and but the, i think the one thing with this staff is and i mentioned this before in a nice little rant is we're probably not going to guarantee any starting spots right we'll let you compete gotta be prepared to compete and i think that that's that's what the hatchet brothers are probably going to want to do they're they're willing to compete they look like it their former joe moore award-winning lineman that that participated one of them started five the other one got about what three or five games in starting and playing they both dealt with some injuries i know landon is hurt right now he hurt his if i'm correct it was his knee and so he didn't play in the national championship so he's hurt at this point um, 
while also, you know, the older brother, the Nigerian is looking at an opportunity to to really play. He's got two years left of eligibility, so I anticipate us picking him up. I love also what we have gotten out the portal. For Beachy Wewu is going to be a beast, man. Spencer Freshman Brown, All-American. dude. Spencer, so I think Spencer Brown's solid. I'm still high on the Jakes, though. Both Jakes. You got Sexton and oh, Taylor. Yeah. I'm really high on them on their um, – on their um on them getting out there and playing so we all know that Sexton's going to definitely probably got that that blind side locked down that's probably his spot now that he's especially now that he's healthy since you know he came off that knee injury in the cheese it bowl uh had his ACL surgery and he's back i anticipate he's going to be the one that you're going to see starting a lot going forward mm-hmm. and i i i like the other jake think that we're going to see him playing a lot too i mean you had a first rounder in and in, in tyler guyton out there and really i mean it's kind of hard to take his spot away from him and as the season it winded down he weren't making the conference championship or playoffs i sensed that they were probably like guyton's like yeah i'm gonna go ahead and rest my body up and get ready for the draft and he's one of the few players that was marked by a lot of the analysts as a guaranteed first rounder dude he was a defensive tackle bro oh yeah guyton which is Guyton still a projected first round pick? Because I know there mm-hmm. was some talk, like, like during bowl season, that he might not be a first rounder. And then I heard some talk that he might be sneaking back in. So I didn't know what if he I was- saw. What I saw before, right around the bowl time, ESPN, one of their analysts dropped his guys that he think are guaranteed first rounders, and Guyton was on that list. And that was late December. And yeah, so curious- now we just got to wait for the camps and the workouts. The good thing for him is his measurables is what's going to keep him there. Like, if you question his play, but you see his measurables, you're going to be like, oh, okay, you was able to do all of that at that size? Yeah. yeah I'm I, curious to see how that. many offensive linemen get drafted this year from Oklahoma because you've got four or five guys. You got, yeah, you got five. You got, you got yeah, Rouse is definitely getting drafted. Yeah, he, Matower, he'll, he'll be four or five. Yeah, I think Matower gets a late round pick. Uh, I think he has a late round grade. I think he does get picked up though, just because of beating bow beating bow. Mm-hmm. Dude, when Andy Reed's talking about your lineman, talking about how much he likes getting players from there. He went, they got, look at Wanye Morris. Got Wanye Morris who played, <laughs> yeah. who's been playing the last few weeks. He purposely went and got him because they've got Cree. They got Blake bell. They're adding dudes. They're like, yeah, no, I want, I want the guys that, that beating bow was coaching. Mm-hmm. Can we and they had more? Orlando Brown jr. Before, you know, he got right. $60 million. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that that's the thing, is that they see Beaten Bow and saw what he's done. They're like, Yeah, I would like that guy's players. Yeah. Which how much does Creed get on his extension? Hundred million? Uh, something Because like I feel like if you're the Chiefs, nice that is the one offensive lineman you pay for. Creed's gotta yeah. make hundred million. I don't think he makes a hundred, but he, I know he's making some he's gonna make some uh some some nice chunks once once this extension kicks in. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, but no. So you got Rouse. Um, I feel like Schaefer would be a late, 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 late pick, like late to almost undrafted. But I feel like he'll get drafted. I feel like Rouse would probably go in the third or fourth round. I would imagine McCade would probably go probably fourth or fifth. I'm seeing Cade as more of a six seven. Uh, and there's no shade on him. It's just you know he's gonna have to prove himself to get up there. But I think he does work out well. I think his camp and measurables and stuff will will help him out. Um, he's athletic enough. I think that um, what helps Rouse is how big of a dude he is. Like he's a giant, enormous human being, right? You add him with how huge Tyler Guyton is, which, like I said, he's defensive tackle to tight end that we converted to a right tackle who monstrous. Pretty excited about that, right? That that's the good thing about having him. And yeah. And Kim, you asked a good question. I mean, freshmen are going to retire off of Schmitty's workouts, man. He's going, he going to have them boys working. <laughs> he already got them working. <laughs> he and their beating their butts, man. Listen, I, listen I've already been talking to some of them, and they just, yeah, it's 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 fun. It's fun to hear the freshmen talk about their Schmitty experiences. Yeah, that's what I want to get my hands on is uh, I need a freshman to come in here and talk to us about what it's like being when you meet Schmitty the first time, how you truly feel like did, did, did he get your attention? The best time for 
OU players and interviews is that after spring game to like summer when they're out of school. Right. So. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. All right. We're about an hour. I'm not going to be here too long for y'all and hold y'all up for the evening. We appreciate it. We got halftime of this 49ers and Lions game with the it's Lions up 24 to 7. Jeez Louise. This is Lions crazy. Chiefs matchup, baby. Rematch. Ow! We're going to bite some kneecaps in the Super Bowl. <laughs> hey, I'm hoping that we get that. Remember how the Lions beat the Chiefs in the first week and they were talking all this crap and we didn't have Kadarius Tony and we didn't have Travis Kelsey in that game and uh, we only lost by one point. Chiefs Super Bowl again. <laughs> we're watching greatness, man. It's not fair that y'all got MJ in his prime. And y'all got, y'all get to actually watch it in full. In, in I don't in, think it's fair that the Chiefs game. defense decided that they wanted to like improve this year. That's true. <laughs> Yep. That'd be like, I just want everybody to realize the Chiefs right now are what Oklahoma could have been with Lincoln Riley if they would have played a defense or at least a half comparable defense. Right. Like that, like they would have probably won that many national championships. They'd be in the national championship all the time. So I, I just think about that all the time. Every time I watch the Chiefs, I go, this is what Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma teams could have been if he would have just been competent. You know, a little bit. So. Thank y'all for pulling up. Please wipe your feet, hit the like button if you're new to the channel, subscribe, and uh, rate review. We got a lot of content coming down the line. It's been, uh, I'm, I'm back this week. I'm going to get some stuff prepared for my next set of vacations and uh, trips because February is pretty quiet, so I'm going to throw some stuff. We're going to talk about rosters. We're going to talk about position groups. We'll dive into a lot of that stuff just to keep you guys, everybody busy and even talk about some of the offers, you know? Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to do that. If you're listening, rate, review, give us five stars. I have, I don't, I need more ratings on the uh, Spotify side. Give us five stars. You don't think we deserve it, so give us five anyway. And so, with that, we'll chop it up with y'all in a few days. PG, let the people know where to find you. Yeah, y'all can find your favorite fake insider over at YouTube. Just the PG show. All one word. All one word. Listen, some of y'all know where I'm getting at that. We'll leave it at that. But y'all can y'all can come find me there. We're talking a lot of recruiting right now. We're talking we're gonna be talking a lot about Bill Bean Bow and the offensive line. And we're gonna be talking about what needs to be fixed, predictions and where we think it could land. I need you guys to come be a part of it. So come join up over there. Love to have you. All right. We'll chop it up a few days. Peace.